So, hi everyone, I'm Stefan from the uh, University of Munich, Germany. Unfortunately, I spent one week in bed and had a flu, so I'm only halfway recovered. I hope I can make 45 minutes. My voice gets a little bit low all the time. Um, I will talk about the Open Type Manicore System Shift. It's a project I started like two and a half years or three years ago. Actually, I had it in mind for four years now. You know, in Germany, PhD takes much longer than in the UK, for example. So I'm in my last year, maybe last two years, it depends. And I want to present you how far we got until now. We're not at the end, we're just in the middle of something. And this is actually where open risk comes in, like the open risk is the hard processor core or system. And I will talk about the stuff that we did around there. So just for all of you, I will give you some motivation and background why doing many cores, talking about the open risk and the other building blocks around that, that we built about the target platforms, the software and the debugging that we uh, have at the moment, and how to get started with OptumSock. So it's actually quite as easy as getting started with OpenRisk, but yes, we are somewhat diverted in our flow of how to get stuff running. Uh, so to show you shortly, I hope I will get through it in the end, a short walkthrough about like how to run a simulation model, how to run an FPGA, a four-core model. Um, yeah, let's hope we get through it. So just short motivation, all of you who didn't attend all this academic stuff before. So we will face like in the single chip cloud computer of Intel, most of you might know, uh, the 48 8 core machine, I think, or 48 time machine. Um, we will have an increasing amount of processor cores and chips later on. And to somehow make it composable and to overcome all the bottlenecks in the communication, we employ network on chip, a technique known for 50 years now, I think, 20 years already. And um, we have some kind of tired organizations called in the papers and also in the company called Talera, for example. Most of you might also know uh, they built a commercial tired manipulation system on chip uh, containing up to 96 or 78 cores at the moment. And there's a lot of engineering research topics around there, of course. So a tile is something like a root I'll talk about later, something like a network interface or network adapter, and uh, essentially the computation power. So the design space is actually quite huge. I'm not going into detail, but uh, first of all, we're talking about the structure of such a system. It's composable, as I said. You can just take the tiles and plug them wherever you want. You have a basic mesh, or ring, or whatever structure, and just compose it. Um, of course, you can research on this. There's some design space, like going on the macro architecture level. This is where I actually come in. I'm doing research on the network interfaces, like network on chip to processor interfaces and message passing day especially. Uh, but they are like in the network on chip, you can research a lot, you can do a lot of the platform organization, uh, memory review and so on, coherency stuff, working on heterogeneous platforms, as I show here, like uh, you have a memory, several compute tiles, and some accelerator tiles, and a lot of other stuff, like the internal tile organization. Uh, here we have shared memory tile, and distributed memory tiles. I will go more details in the talk, but as you can see, there's a lot of topics involved here. And if you go out to the conferences, there are many people researching this. But the problem is, if you're researching this, you will feel kind of hard to demonstrate your results of your research in some kind of real-world environment. So the prototyping of such a platform, of course, requires that you have a starting platform in hand, or you have to put everything from scratch. And as I didn't have the first, I had to do the second. Uh, of course, you don't have to necessarily, but you wanted to for our institute and in the end for everybody else who wants to use it. Uh, we are trying to get this prototype of a many core based on open risk running. And the goal is to have a flexible prototyping platform for such tile based many core multi core systems. So you can start your research or whatever work for your hardware optimizations or do some design alternatives that we talked about before. Um, what you get of us is a set of basic components, an easy way to handle with it. And uh, of course, I have to mention it's not a production ready platform. This is somehow based on FPGAs or emulation platforms or whatever. So we're not going for any ASIC or even claim it's production ready. But it's just like in the end that you can show you advancements that you did in research in a real world platform. Yeah? So something that's capable of running something near real time on your desktop. So, and, yeah, of course, the last I don't have to tell here. This is a slide, of course, from other talks. It's open, you can download it. That's a Git repository hosted by us. 
based on open risk, full of different licenses, of course, uh, mainly from GPL. So the idea, like, this is something that is not really there, but some kind of Python script exists, this was some platform generator tool, this is where it gets some kind of academic buff there. I will not talk about much, um, talk much about this. We have something like a two-step uh, way to go. You have your basic elements and some layout ideas, some target platforms. You will compose out of this your basic idea of the platform, and in the second step, you will generate based on some stencils and your selections for different targets that can be like RTL simulation, FPGA prototype, and FPGA emulation, as we do, and uh, also the basic flow, of course, later. Um, your output files, like make files, and all this stuff. Um, I'll skip this. Um, as I said, the main building block down there is, of course, open risk then. Um, at the moment, we still have something like oh, uh, 1200 in there. I did a very simple extension to this. There's more or less just some core identifier that we needed. Uh, we did a lot of stuff around there, but most of this ended somewhere in the Nirvana. Um, recently, we saw everybody's moving to MO1KX, so we also do. Um, this is some work in progress. I think last week or last two weeks, we already got a lot of stuff done. We put a lot of stuff upstream we were working on. Um, I will talk about these two slides. So the main thing you have to do, the first thing is, of course, to be able to identify yourself. You know, this is the extension that we also have in your 1000P. I uh, have some kind of core identifier, just as an SPR. I just took, again, another free one. Maybe I should somehow get it like in the spec which one it should be, because we have to change it, because I can find something different now. Um, now, what we also need is some kind of, we also heard and talked before, a uh, way to do atomic transactions. This is not in the OpenRisk uh, 1000 spec at all. Um, yeah, this was just a small, uh, I think it was the first very long I ever wrote in my life was this compare and swap unit. Um, this should be replaced with something like a thing called uh, link store conditional, but it's somewhere in the near future and the far future. So this works somehow as like a memory map device. You set the address, you set the compare value, you set the swap value, you do a read, and it will do the atomic operation for you. And this whole sequence, of course, has to be guarded against uh, interrupts or uh, context switches. Um, as we don't have shadow registers, in uh, 1200 at least, and I think that's not in uh, 1k, um, you will need some kind of scratch memory if you run seven instances on the open risk X in the same memory to store the register set, or like at least the fundamental part of the register set, on uh, specified memory addresses. So if you look in the Linux kernel, I think there's also something used like the base address. Similar we do it, we use something like addresses 4 to uh, 96 or something uh, to store the registers and exceptions. Uh, I think this might be overcome. You won't be able to move it somewhere in there. So we use the QMAM in for 1200. More importantly, independent more or less of the kind of platform you run is you need cache coherency. Uh, very critical topic, also relates to consistency. There's a lot of open top, uh, like, the problems that we have in open risk. There's some kind of specification in the original architecture manual about cache coherency. I find it somewhat vague, but too precise. This is a little bit strange. Um, Something that should at least then, uh, like with 2K, of course, uh, be taken into account uh, the consistency model, the coherency model, and so on. Um, what we did is the current uh, MO1KX has write through. We had it for the 1200 or right back also. Uh, snoop invalidation, so you snoop the bus, the bus has an extra port that gives back all writes to the outside. Uh, we have an extra state that is snoop invalidate. Fortunately, the structure of the M01K uh, XD cache is in a way that you can respond to it within one cycle at every, at any point in time because we don't have any separate infrastructure to use a normal bus. Uh, that's a clear advantage here. Yeah? Otherwise, you have to keep somehow pace or have something like an invalidation acknowledge scheme. But this was you don't need if you can snoop a bus that does normally be three transactions. It doesn't work with before. before. Um, this is running in force in-house, as I said, we are in the process of bringing this upstream. Um, 
what we worked on last half year, one year already, is a two cache coherency directory based. This somehow doesn't really relate to open risk anymore. You have to see it's a component just plug in there. So this has to be I, of course, and B. Um, if you go for a shared memory system, you might have some second level cache, maybe it's a third level cache, and if you get to network on chip, um, the, you can't snoop anymore. Yeah? So you can't just observe what's happening. You have to somehow have a protocol. Everybody of you who heard some basic programming might have known uh, that there's like two different ways of doing cache coherency. The one snooping, the other one is directory based. And uh, this is what we did. We have a level two cache that has consistency uh, port that I'll talk about later and uh, works with either centralized or distributed directories. And uh, we are happy that there are only slight changes to the L1 and the bus to support this. This is more or less only to get the information from the L2 to the L1 also. Yeah? So the bus, of course, doesn't allow you to get this. So what we do is uh, we will retry our misses because otherwise on a miss in the level 2 cache, you might store the bus for the whole time that the operation takes. And if you have a read miss of a, of a cache line that's in another tile at the moment as a modified state, this can take a serious amount of time. Uh, so of course, we do a retry. We change the L1 cache to wait after retry for a special signal it gets in from the L2 cache uh, to advance. Furthermore, you need L2 to L1 invalidations. Therefore, our bus model was extended with some kind of bus holding so that after the current arbitration, the bus will be held by the L2 cache and will put on the snoop port the same information that the other L1 cache also put. So this is somehow also kind of transparent. Uh, we will have some extra signals, but they are like more or less information. So you will need to know, like the bus had to be extended, that you know the master that uh, has the arbitration in slave also because this is somehow important for you to order the transactions. So the L2 works with all of order transactions. It can start like jumping around with different cache lines that it locks at the moment. So it gets kind of complicated. The level 2 cache is undocumented, like 2,000 lines of earlier code. Um, we will see how we will get it in a shape that it can be used by anybody at any point in time. Uh, we hope to get this ready as soon as possible. Um, we have something working on this permanently until the end of November, and I hope this is a time for us to public. So beside the open risk I talked about now, we have a yeah, very badly rendered by Power from over here. It's called ListNOC. This is the name of the institute I'm looking at. Uh, it's a very basic network on chip implementation that was there before Optin Fox started, so this was the starting point. The whole idea was of course already there. So we got into this, we have a very basic wormhole packet switch dimension routing uh, network. So everybody who doesn't know about network on chip, it means that the most simple way of transferring packets around without having connections or something. Uh, you need virtual channels if you want something like this. Everybody's not familiar with the model standard. It's too complicated to explain it now. Uh, but what is very important, configure buffering. The buffering is network on chip, the most critical part from an area point of view. Um, and it's very easy to extend. There's no only claim this is true because we try to code it in the most easy and understandable way. And this is, of course, in my opinion, the most crucial part of getting people to use and contribute to it. Uh, so it may, at some points, I see that it's not really optimum, optimized, but um, we don't want to put too much optimization in there because more or less the aggressive tools nowadays make the best out of it. We have some feature extensions, we have bufferless routers, we set buffer, and buffers are very expensive. We have priorities for multicast, adaptive routing, we have a known technique called selective discarding. Um, there's a lot of stuff to make the network on chip more, work more efficient. And we have some infrastructure around there, like different network adapters, that's my precise research. Uh, we have some AXI protocol adapters and some monitoring infrastructure. Would you, would you see this knock as a replacing wishbone in time? Uh, no, so but we also use it like as in a in a in a racket view. So locally, we always have like something like a wishbone bus or wishbone crossbar, and the second level is connected by by listener. But you could use a wishbone to listener adapter. We also have it's just packet packetization stuff. Yeah, like, so you have to so the, the knock itself doesn't know anything about reads or writes, so it only knows packets that it can transmit. 
And so you need some kind of protocol continuation over the knock. On one side you have a master termination, on the other side you have a slave that behaves like a master. And um, you just have to continue the protocol of the network on chips. So this is a network on chips are used for you. As I said, we're focusing on two, and only two, uh, layouts. We have a distributed memory, because it's not easy to extinct maybe, so they have like one, two, something, four to eight cores. In a compute tile, we have a local memory and the network adapter, I left you connect out here. This uh, memory is shared among them. So we already here need the L1 cache coherency if you want to run it in a coherent way. Um, the global memory can then be, if you have one, cooperatively shared among tiles by using DMA transfers. This is what we usually do. We use some paging uh, as the local memory is kind of restricted. So you have something like a few Ks up to maybe one megabyte locally. Um, and if you need to do something like page swapping, it goes with DMA. So you can also use between them with DMA, but additionally we have something with message passing, different styles of it. Uh, I'm not going to do too much details, but the next slide I'll try to talk about it. And the other thing is what we yeah, most recently started is shared memory stuff. Easiest way is to do load stores, as I told you before, this protocol continuation, so you terminate the bus there, and at the memory you yeah, conduct the same operation as I wish there. Um, and you can do a lot of them concurrently, but somehow if you come to a point that you introduce a cache, also there I want to have a real shared memory system as the shared memory programming paradigm tells you, it has to be coherent. Yeah, you can of course also use shared memory without coherency, but that's the reason we do it. We want to have it uh, in a way that you can use peace like that. So um, then as I said, we will use something like directly coherency extend this moment. But additionally, what we also see is like the midterm way, there's like hybrid systems where you have shared memory uh, and full blown coherency for general purpose use, but you can speed up your communication between tasks and threads by using dedicated message passing. And so you could use explicit message passing in your software to be faster because if you want to communicate um, over shared memory and cache coherency, that gets kind of very long. Yeah, because you're writing something with cache lines, you have to lock them, you have to unlock them. It takes a lot of time, you send a lot of messages around, and message passing is in that sense more efficient because it's direct point to point, also the lock. Yeah. The problem is, of course, still the memory bottleneck and shared memory, because everything goes to the shared memory at some point. So, I'll stop here. Let's talk shortly about network adapters. Um, as I said, as the main engine, that in this system transfers bulk between the compute tiles or this paging between memory and local, uh, local memory and local memory. Uh, we have some message passing. The most simple one is this one here. This is to FIFOs, where you can just put in flits, that's the basic unit of a network chip packet, and compose them by yourself. You can write them in memory map, and you can read them out memory map. You get an IQ with the messages there, and you can take it out. Uh, we have some more like asynchronous stuff, where this automatically does this on a global ring buffer in the entire local memory to be more efficient and get down the interrupt rate, because the interrupt rate is of course the most critical point here. If you, so network on chip packet usually contains like yeah, eight times four bytes, something like 32 bytes. Uh, you should not make your worms much, long, much longer because then your network on chip efficiency, efficiency will decrease. And Therefore, if you're on each of this packet, you have to raise an interrupt and have a context switch of like 300 cycles. Uh, this is, of course, not very efficient. What we also have, this is like more or less my research contribution, is completely asynchronous uh, message passing that runs um, completely without an intervention with the operating system. In a sense, also, that it doesn't raise interrupts at all, but instead manipulates the data structures of the uh, operating system whenever a uh, message arrived that a threat is waiting for. Uh, we also need some kind of locking for shared memory systems at the moment we use because we found it somehow most transparent. The, some explicit locking infrastructure that works on reserved memory blocks in a way beside the coherency. So we have to have the non-coherent those memory blocks and there's just a dedicated module in the compute tile and one in the memory tile. And by that way, 
um, yeah, you can pretty much uh, sample uh, the synchronization of shared memory system. There, of course, is the point where I talked about consistency. You have to be careful about consistency stuff that you're talking about. What you do is some kind of relaxed consistency. So whenever a lock occurs, you have to be sure that all outstanding transactions on level two cache are finished. Yeah, so that was what I talked about before. There are some other tiles. I'm not going to go too much in detail. So you have some memory tiles, of course, for block RAM. If you have most of you that work with FPGAs, you know memory is the most restricted resource that we have. So we have some DRAM, of course. Um, we have like the, always the mirror uh, protocol communication in there. Um, yeah, so it's just more or less wishbone to then the uh, DDR control. We have some accelerator tiles, as I said before. The trend goes towards having several accelerator tiles and just turn them on or off whenever you don't need them uh, to save the energy. But then turn them on when you need to offload very compute intensive tasks to uh, better hardware part. Uh, this needs to handle a knock protocol, which is kind of very simple, but also message protocol. This is like then like the layer above, um, if necessary. So currently we work on an AES type of cryptographic functions where you then can, like, on runtime decide whether you want to start an AES computation locally in software or remotely in the AES type. We have IOs, something we didn't really uh, focus on, I have to admit, so we more or less use UART for some control stuff. We have such as well iRobots, if you know them, those Hoover robots. Uh, one of them is like very easy to, to use for, for research, and we work more or less on this one. Um, I will talk about how we use IO ish stuff. Um, or they have research as a virtual network card, but as a brother at this point. Shortly about target platforms, as I said, RTL simulation. We use models and it's easy to adapt it to other simulators. I know at the university it's kind of easy because we have all the tools, more or less for free. Um, it can be adapted by all this tickle scripting, you can't get this out of the PDA tools, unfortunately. Um, it's really easy to, to go to, to other slides of synopsis. Um, it's a good entry point for hardware developers, as I am, so for me it's the usual way to start developing. Yeah, Pro, I don't have to tell you, it's very good to use, more than it's a very powerful tool. We have a short turnaround time in development of hardware, contract slow in licenses, so this is the reason we also have very related RTL simulations in the second half. Similar to above, but for hardware debuggers, I don't really like the very related approach um, because of the missing transparency of those points. Um, you, so we see it more like for software system developers to use it. Um, we have essentially two FPGA, FPGA boards that we work on. We have the third one now uh, that we are currently working on. We try to select some that we find good and that many people use. Um, maybe somebody of you already has some of them. I will talk about it in the next slide. Um, and what we also use is, of course, very costly. But this is the only way to get your real manicure running. It's an FPGA emulation platform, the former one. It's a Synopsis Shipit platform, former Platinum. It has uh, six Vertex 5 FPGA, of the largest, like the RX C30. So you can get there a massive amount of OS process across in there. And yeah, the tool more or less, let's say less, does all the work for you to distribute it uh, and to do the time conversions. But this is very costly, and if you don't have it, uh, I don't think it's very costly. What, what sort of performance do you get out of a Verilator model? And then a single open, you know, old Orpsop model goes about, what, 100 kilohertz? Yes. Uh, so 500. This is a big, what, sorry? 500. Well, you've got a faster machine, that's why. Right. <laughs> <laughs> <The>, um, <laughs> um, but how, once you start putting all this on, what sort of speeds do you get out of your Verilator models? Uh, honestly, I must say I don't care. <laughs> Because I more or less always go to the FPGA to get the performance I need. So for the very later, like as I said, if I say like for software developers, it's for me software developments ends usually after two milliseconds because then everything's booted and running and I know it's okay. Um, what, what do you mean by less hardware insight into the very related RTL? I thought it, I thought you could dump. 
everything out of there. Yeah, I can dump everything out, but if you use models in and you can extract like FSMs and all the stuff and get a oh, okay. like trace back analysis and see the cause of a signal change and all the stuff. Okay. This you don't get and this is very comfortable if you know how to use it. Sounds like some good very later uh, product requirements to me. <laughs> <laughs> So those are the two FPGAs we support. First, Sinus University program, but it's five. Uh, also, code and on 509, I think. It's widely distributed. I think it's out of stock already. Uh, it's Vertex 5, of course. It's uh, not produced anymore. It has a lot of I.O. on it, and you can get something like six to 10 cores on it. Um, yeah, I.O. is good on this one, but very hard to integrate. Uh, we worked on a lot of stuff, like the DBI we got on it and so on. But everybody who worked with exciting university program for lots of years, for the hell of it. So what we used instead for most of the work, especially regarding software and so on, is a board, very small outline like this one. It's also an open source project, ZX. You think it's also an open course, the PCB and all this stuff, but it's a German company also we found accidentally. Um, it, its main advantage is it has an easy USB Cypress chip, and you can do all the stuff uh, over the Cypress chip, so you don't need any JTAG programming cable, and this is what I will show you later on, we will do everything on the USB connection. Uh, so it's very easy to use, you get the USB 2.0 at a reasonable speed, um, and there are two versions of the newest board, one can be used with Exynos Lab Pack, it has a Spartan 675, and this is the larger one, it's a Spartan 650, there you can get something like 16 cores on, uh, they have an open source discount up to 50% if you're doing like core hardware research. Um, uh, we also applied for this, so we can also get it. And we find it somewhat ideal for software development if you don't have any IO. So what we also use some kind of transactor based. That means you can have the system C model on your host PC and over the USB. There's a module inside the a system that behaves like the tile that you model in system C and we get the timing down and all this stuff. This is some research that we're also doing at the moment. Uh, it will be also part of the project when it's done once it's done, of course. Let's only talk about programming. I'm not uh, the best programmer in the world. I'm a hardware guy. Uh, we try to re reuse as much as possible. Um, we have a very basic bare metal library that essentially is the drivers for the network adapter some utility functions like getting your rank and all the stuff, everybody who did MPI before knows what I mean. Uh, we have a very simple runtime system. It's a scheduler and a virtual memory management. Um, it's encapsulated in libraries, <coughs> and port and rest using its library. Um, we didn't do this because we're finding this uh, functionality. And for the APIs, for the communication, we somehow rely on this multiple association, if you know it, it's a non-profit organization. There's a lot of companies and universities in there try to standardize embedded APIs for future multicores. Very simple message passing in the communication API. And there's this MTAP here, it's very new for threading. We have a prototype, the first prototype implementation of MTAP for optimal sort distributed memory. So we talk about debugging. Um, we don't use one control debugging, we'll talk about later differences. But instead, we have something like a separate debug knock that's a ring. Uh, you have some kind of debug modules that are somehow hyper-connected or explicitly connected to your system. Um, you have no interference in the system in that way. Uh, and you need a host interface to get data in and out. Uh, on the set dashboard, we have the advantage of easy to use uh, USB 2.0. On the XUP board, we implemented a hardware TCP implementation. It sounds a little bit weird in the first look, but in second glance, it takes like 4% of the resources and it's very efficient. And on the 605 board, we switched to recently, we have TCP and PCI Express. Uh, yeah, using this, you get a connection to the board and you can control the clock, you can do clocking and the stuff and, um, and reset the system. You can also put fluids inside the system. Uh, you can monitor everything and you get some traces out of there. So we talk about trace-based debugging, so most of you are used to run control debugging, meaning GDB or something where you can step through your code, uh, you can read up registers and this stuff. Um, if you want to debug parallel problems, this is not very efficient anymore because at the moment if you stop the system, your concurrency problem might be gone away. 
Uh, that's the reason in multi-core debugging you need this trace-based debugging. Uh, you trace system events, you analyze the concurrency problems offline, or pseudo offline. Um, you get problems with the IO when you have to hold the clock in case your interface to the host is overflowing. Yeah. We have more or less related to your risk, we have two trace modules, instruction trace, based on the advancement of the pipeline, it gets the program count of the execute state out there, and we do some compression in there, you can like detect branches and only um, from the branches, you can compress this further and so on. A lot of complicated stuff in there. The other thing is what we find very useful to use is the NMK stuff. Uh, I think it's pretty much used also in the simulator, the over case. Uh, we also use it in the hardware by uh, tracking all writes of the register file, filtering out the ones to R3. We use R3 as the value of an event. We use the K as the event ID. And that way we are able to instrument the code in a very simple way um, and with very low impact on the, on the software because this is also very important in parallel problems. The instrumentation has to have as less um, impact on the software as possible. Um, there are different backends then. You have the debug knob. If you run very related simulations, we have TCP sockets to do the same communication. We have a, a library that encapsulates the communication with all systems. Uh, you get the connection management, you can register the callbacks for the trace events. It's multi threaded and we have a uh, perfect user interface. I will shortly show you afterwards, QT based. Um, at the moment, it doesn't do much, but displaying events uh, doesn't stand out and replacement and it's very easy to extend once you understand the code that's not documented. So, how to get started? Get the stuff from OpenSock.org, it's a website. Um, you can get in contact, of course regarding any question, but if you have a board that you want to support and you're fine with uh, not using any I.O., we can get it up and running, running very fast, uh, or if you have any other ideas. Uh, what you can find in the repository is like 5% of all the work we've done. The problem is we don't want to put anything in public that's not uh, at least to a certain degree understandable or documented. And as most of the stuff comes out of student projects, uh, you can somehow guess the code quality and all the stuff. You have to review all the stuff, get it in. Besides this, I'm still working on my normal stuff and teaching. So it takes a lot of time, but if you want to do something, always talk to us first. There's a good chance you already did it. Yeah. Um, so just call me and we can do it. I will just shortly, I hope, uh, show you how to use this board, some very related stuff, how, the inter how all the stuff looks like, if you're interested. Um, and then yeah, maybe you can give questions afterwards. It's fine with you. Okay? So, are we going to chair? There are essentially three repositories if you start. Um, this is the ListNock repository, the OpenSock repository, and the tool chain. This is more or less only the new lib. Uh, which we, yeah, we changed the open risk port slightly, created our own machine target to get this multi-core stuff in there and some specifics like getting the core ideas. So what were the three repositories? Um, ListNock, OptimSock, and OptimSock TrueChain. They are all, ah, yeah, I'm showing the website, the website. Uh, there's also a virtual box in there, so there's everything packed in it. You should wait one week at least until I put a new release online. Um, those are the two Git repositories. You can browse it also with the Git web. Um, and there's a user guide that doesn't look good in this resolution. Um, it's also available as PDF. You can build it inside there. It's more or less the Git one put on the web every time you do a release. Um, and it contains also a tutorial. So those are the three. Um, so the organization of the repository on first glance looks more or less like what you know from OpSoc version 2 or something. Is it possible to read it? Um, so as we said later, the idea is that you just open this tool and you can uh, like tape out your, or, like, generate your system that you want, click the button and get all the files and build it. Yeah? Um, at the moment, we have all the components and we have some demonstration systems. Yeah? So if you go to the source RTL folder, this is the stuff that you will find in here and there are some systems that you can already use ready for draw uh, for, for usage. Like this is a two times two system having four routers and four compute tiles 
in a distributed memory fashion. And this is exactly the one that I will talk about now. Um, <coughs> maybe you can have a short look at it uh, to show you that it's kind of easy to generate different systems directly from this one. Um, I will not go into the details. So somewhere here you instantiate the, the network of chip that you're using. Um, somewhere down here you have a generate loop generating four uh, compute uh, tiles. Here we somehow get out the trace ports that I talked about before that we somehow directly wire into the, uh, this one. Here you can initialize the memory and the stuff and this is the whole module. Yeah, it's kind of easy to, to plug it together and that's the main reason we didn't work more, much more on this tool at the moment. Yeah, so it's kind of pretty much like the six wires uh, that you get usually out of a, of a computer, of a tile. So beside this, as I said, the software, um, we have the firmware for this board, we have host software, we have system software, system software, um, maybe the most important, the moment for distributed memory mainly, um, it's auto tools based, we have different libraries for all of the stuff that you might need, we link it together in the end, we generate package config files, and the make file in, link our script in and so on, and then you I uh, have to spe specify some small defines and external uh, variables and you can just link them to your stuff and you don't have to build it for your system separately. So, so when you're running the software, I mean, are you running a full-blown Linux system on there? Or no. Do you, no, no, you're just running bare metal with a, a sort of souped up C library? No, I have a, a very small, uh, it's a lean runtime system in fact. Okay. Uh, so. So, the problem is with the research I do, if you do it with a full-blown Linux, most of the effects will go into the noise. Yeah. Uh, so you have to somehow, of course, get the, all the times in the other layers that don't directly relate to the communication. Um, so, of course, it's possible to port Linux on this one, but we didn't put the effort on somehow. So if you go to the tbench folder, there's the RTL folder, the radio operator folder. Um, just shortly, like this is a, the same system now that I already uh, generated. Uh, what you have to do if you want to build your software, you generate one of those uh, software folders in there and you have to provide at least this one. This more or less are some defines related to the OptumSock. Yeah, it tells it that C variables that are used by the libraries, external li libraries to be linking them. Where you tell them like how many copy tiles are there, how they are numbered and how large the memory is, which state you want to use, and so on. And then there's a small script, um, because we want to link the stuff here and don't want to copy it, uh, to get a small example running. Uh, hello world example. Uh, it's linked into here, meaning that um, you, we have it in the central repository, it's also there, like in the system software. Uh, because if you run it in several systems, of course, you don't want to copy around the, the software all the time. Yeah? And the make file is essentially only including the make file, uh, executing the package config to get it, and we done more. Um, let me shortly show you the software. It's also a very basic example only. Um, it has a main function where depending on the rank that you are, either you are call zero or you're one of the others. So call zero waits for the um, for messages from the other cores and then sends them out again and wakes them up, some kind of barrier, and each of them will put on the hell world whenever it does it. Um, this is the way that you assemble messages, you can see here over the knock. Of course, it's much easier to use the M copy, uh, but the example is more complex because you have to set up other data structures before. Uh, and then you just call OptumSock MP simple send and it will send a message to the other one. Uh, you set a destination, you set a class and your own rank. And the other ones, um, yeah, they send it. This one is waiting until it got all of them. Uh, you have to register in the beginning the interrupt, of course. Um, this is similar in the yeah, risk chain. This receive function is called whenever a message arrives. And we all just do stuff that's happening there. There are this open source trace functions, those are just like encapsulating some of the uh, STM traces, software traces in background. So you can define sections, so the GUI you will then see like an execution chart, the times at which which section was executed. Plus you can have discrete events, um, but there's none of them here. Um, yeah, long story short, 
build it, you get out the normal stuff. Um, yeah, we dynamically generate a linker script because unfortunately you can't use variables in there uh, for the memory size, so we pass it out of the um, of the OptumSoc sysconfig O that I talked about before and just uh, replace it in there. Uh, in the end, we get the VMAM and the bare binary file, of course, of the ELF. And what you do is you link it up down to here. And so there you make it. And then you have execute the validated model. It will start listening on the port that we use for the uh, TCP. This is the GUI that we use. Um, we go to simulation TCP for the preset to this port. Uh, you get this graphical user interface. It's the important one. You can connect. You will enumerate them. And then you can just start it. The number is preloaded. And now you should see the execution of it, and this is the performance you get for a few he hello worlds, and there are some. <coughs> so if you zoom out, this is what you can see. Those are the discrete events that I saw, talked about. We have a reset exception in the beginning. We have this section. This is the stuff that we uh, that's defined by the by the Bernard library system start. Uh, besides this, those are the sections that are defined. Yeah, I don't have the software open, but as I told you, I define them in the beginning. And then each time I enter it, I just call the enter function and it will update the GUI. And the smaller events we have in here, um, these are the message simple receive, and the other one, of course, the send. There you can see the parameters and the timestamp. And we have a very convenient way to define them. Um, so, in the, so you don't have to recompile or anything. Um, it's in the host software. Uh, we have the open source GUI, we have events D folder. And in there, for example, just uh, this is just what I did this morning. Yeah, you can just define them in a like column separated way. You say which ID should be displayed in which way, uh, like the format that you can put in there. You say how width it should be, how it should be, and you say which color it should have. And then this one is passed in the start of the GUI and will be added. Then you get this discrete event in the execution trace to see what happens. So you can very easy uh, debug your software in this way, at least in a very long and away. So I will go out here. Um, as I'm running out of time, just told me this is the board. As I said, very easy to use. Plug the power, this is the one. I have to show you. I'm not sure your plug's fully in there. You might be suffering from British power. Oh. That's it. Try that. Hmm. Maybe I should use another one. Looks better. So like I said, it needs a USB connection, USB, you plug it in. All these boards share one uh, device identifier, so if you do LS USB, you will see nothing but this device. It doesn't even have a name. There's a tool coming with it called Film Loader uh, that you can use to enumerate it. And this one tells us like what uh, this one is. Yeah, it's like it has their own, they have their own infrastructure for replacing vendor and device ID for open source projects. So this is a slightly modified firmware that does all this uh, FIFO interfering, uh, interfacing, and also tells you like the, what capabilities the system has. Yeah? Um, if you now want to uh, load your firmware, as I said, I pre-synthesized it, of course. Um, because we're running out of time, I'll just load it. Um, building it more or less means we have only, to, yeah, only, but we have to put a glue logic around. So, like beside the top level system, so like two times two, we now have something like the set a specific one that uh, instantiates the multi-port memory controller. Each of the cores get the 32 megabyte share of the DRAM. So we don't really have local memory, but instead like uh, do the like partitioning of the of the main memory, and you can download this one via the USB. And basic text stream, text from milliseconds, and once we have done this, before I go to the GUI, uh, there's also a command line interface that we have. Um, if you just run it, it will enumerate the system, it will tell you which modules are there. They have some kind of addresses, that's how the, the backend works. It has interactive mode, so once you're there, you can do something like memory initialization. 
uh, and some other stuff that I will now do with the GUI, um, like writing back the instruction traces of all cores to files, writing out the, um, the software traces of all the cores, and so on. Um, yeah, but as I'm running out of time, just show you the GUI, um, essentially the same stuff, reconnect, and before we disconnect here, of course. Once you overcome the problems of the USB, you can connect. So it enumerates the system. And uh, here we have to initialize the memories. And this we do by simply selecting the file. Now it doesn't find it. Um, And we start the um, software on the FPGA. And this is how you hopefully can see that it's easy to use it. If it's really easy to use, it's open to you. Uh, yeah, we highly encourage everybody to use it in their projects if you're related to this one. And I hope we can help you out. Maybe you can help us out. And as I said, like, there will be some contributions regarding the uh, cache hierarchy and coherency stuff in the near future. Good, thank you very much. Um, while John is setting up, we'll just take a couple of questions from Stefan. Thank you very much. Um, questions? Dave? Uh, you've got a little scheduler there, and you've got some message passing hardware. Was the uh, scheduler default text swapping of the message passing hardware in any way? Um. Do you mean by this? Virtualization. So. Yeah, we have some, um, some way to virtualize it in a way that we, um, that we separate, like you have several slots in there, you can have several files instead of one, and they are mapped to uh, page boundaries, so you can access them at the page boundaries, the page address is then like the FIFO address, and by that way you can virtualize the, the message passing by mapping the individual pages to that several slots. Um, I'm sorry. I saw that you're using QT. Do you yeah. plan to port it to Windows, Mac? Or? No, I don't plan. <laughs> yeah, that's like you already have a lot of trouble getting running on Linux, and I know it's much more trouble than Windows, so we haven't even considered it. I have to honestly tell you. I hope. So, from my experience, I already tested it. You can use the virtual box image for what the USB and also use all the stuff there. So, it should be fair enough. I think the QT will be the the less troubling part because PC is also there for Windows. Yeah, that's yeah. why maybe I thought maybe yeah. you were expecting maybe. Yeah, I don't think it's a lib USB, I think it's all supported, but I don't even know how to compile a Windows application, so I will not start it. So if anybody is interested in it, of course I'm very covering it. It's a great thing about an open source project. I think stopping someone else. <laughs> uh, I will take one more question then. Um, you briefly demonstrated the tool chain. It seemed to only output one binary. I mean, what's the I mean, a large part of the problem of like many core socks is the, the tool chain and you know partitioning code between different cores and so on. Yeah, so this is something we stand, like the partitioning itself is up to the user computer. Okay. So you, what you can do is you can compile different uh, binaries and there's something like a Python script I wrote that can create uh, larger binaries and elf loading and stuff. Um, this is essentially for the shared memory very important. Uh, for the other one, we more or less stick to like manually assigned the course, like pinning. Um, we have this MT API that I talked about. It's, in, it's like POSIX, but somehow very vague. Yeah, it's like something that just says, like, I want to start a task that's defined by an action, and then the runtime system can decide where to start this action. As for example, you say you have a job that is the AES. Uh, you have two different actions that implement it. The one is a software action, the one is a hardware action. And depending on the system load, and your expectation of the uh, like utilization of the hardware accelerator, for example, the runtime system that we have, selects the matching one, like this dynamic assignment. This is something we also research on, like dynamic task allocation, yeah. like once you start parts of it. But if you're doing anything like automatic partitioning and so on, yeah, you just have to come up with C files and put them in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything we are up there is not really of my focus. Of course, it's interesting to me, but yeah, my time is limited. <laughs>